Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to a uh, webinar. Today we have uh, Valentin Paranzi from Sao Paulo University, and he's speaking on envelopes and capital LP spaces. Valentin? Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Benjamin. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this and for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a work in progress with Jordi Lopez Arpad from Wimnet Madrid. This is still a lot, uh, pretty much in progress. And um, so here's the outline. The first part will be this notion of envelope we try to develop. Uh, and the second part, I will uh, go a little bit back in time and talk about what uh, is called uh, Thrice-Ebana Spaces, and this is related to another work uh, of myself with Jordi, with Bruce Mbombo and Stefan Todosevic, who is going to be published this year, and which is actually the motivation for, for the notion of, of envelope. And uh, I will, uh, the third section will be applications of, of these notions, mainly to the case of LP spaces, uh, either to find new results about those spaces, or maybe to look at known results from another point of view, and with the hope of maybe uh, generalizing some notions. Okay. Um, so what do we mean by an envelope map in this talk? Uh, this is a map uh, inside a fixed banner space X assigning to any subset A of X uh, a closed subspace of X, which we call its envelope. And it will be called an envelope if it has satisfied the following properties. Uh, actually, my screen, yeah, okay. Can you see? Uh... Yeah, the last line is strictly convex tool. Yeah, I think now it's better, I think you can see. It was fine before. Yeah, but I mean, a part was missing, right? Uh, yeah, the last line was yeah, missing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 Here it's missing, so like this. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll okay. okay. Um, so the envelope has to contain A, of course. Um, it has to be uh, increasing respect to inclusion. Uh, we want the envelope of a to be equal to the envelope of the closed Lyon span of A, and the envelope of the envelope is the same as the envelope. So uh, natural examples, one, the first one, which is not really interesting, just assigned to A its closed Lyon span. Uh, another natural example, if X is a banal lattice, is what I denote by lat of A, which is the closed sub lattice generated by A. And when X is reflexive, strictly convex with uh, strictly convex uh, dual norm, then what we call the minimal envelope, which is the smallest uh, one complemented subspace of X containing A. So Calvert in 76 proved that under these conditions, there is indeed uh, a smallest uh, one complemented subspace of X uh, containing A. Uh, Actually, you take the intersection of all one complemented subspaces of X containing A and you get something which is again uh, one complemented. And so um, it seems that the canonical way of constructing uh, an envelope is, or maybe a more global point of view, is you fix a certain class of spatial subspaces of the space, which are the envelopes, uh, because of D being an envelope is the same as being equal to, uh, to its own envelope. And once you have your class of envelopes, then the envelope of A is just the smallest uh, envelope containing A, assuming uh, such an object exists. And um, okay, initially, um, we came up with this idea, uh, I'm gonna define a specific envelope uh, we were looking at uh, LP spaces, um, and of course you have the no notion of support, which is important for a vector or subspace, and we wanted somehow to 
uh, have a notion which would be reminiscent of the notion of, to the notion of support, but that could be defined in any banner space, not only in a function space. And so, but then uh, after we came up with one or two definitions, we uh, discovered uh, something very similar, which uh, existed in the literature. So I'm going to start with that. So we shall be interested in what we call the Korovkin envelope, which uh, associated to a given bounded semigroup G of operators on X. So this is defined as follows. Uh, you take a subset and you, uh, you will take the set of uh, element X in X, such that whenever a net of elements of G converges pointwise to the identity on A, then it will uh, also converge to the identity in X, or T alpha of X converges to X. Um, so, uh, Godovkin and others were mostly interested in the case of the uh, semi-group of contractions, and in which case the envelope was called uh, shadow of A. And also, uh, when X was a, a, a banal lattice in the semi-group of positive contractions. And then they were interested in Korovkin sets. So a Korovkin set A is a set of which the shadow is as big as possible with the whole, whole space X. So of course, it's a set, uh, if you control what happens uh, with the, uh, in this case, with the contractions in terms of limit on A, then you, you know what happens globally on X. And so they were interested in finding examples of minimal Korovkin sets. So for example, um, one T T square is a Korovkin set for C of zero one proved by Woolcott in 68. Korovkin, that's the first paper in this, in this uh, area, uh, proved this in the case of uh, this semi-group of positive contractions. Regarding LP spaces, then you, you have the set 1T, proved by Bellano in 74, and for in the reflexive range and variance Lorentz for P equals to 1. And um, then, so this was a, an area which has uh, act, uh, sufficiently active to have a session in Nobel Wolfar in, in the 70s. And then in 75, uh, Calvert generalized a bit what happens in LP spaces. He proved that if X is a reflexive space with LUR norm and LUR dual norm, so for example, let's say, uh, uniformly convex and uniformly smooth, then the shadow is just the same as what I call the minimum envelope. It's just the smallest uh, one complemented subspace, subspace containing A. Um, actually, it's enough to assume that the, the dual norm is strictly convex. And um, I mean, that the norm is LUR and the dual norm is strictly convex. And so in particular, if you take a subset of NP in the reflexive range, um, this is true. The shadow is equal to the minimal envelope. And since we are in LP spaces, assuming A is unital, it is just the close of that is generated. Uh, usually, it's not too difficult to reduce the study of the envelopes to the unital case for function spaces. And it's also true for P equals to 1. Um, after that, what we could find in the literature was uh, mostly concentrated on C of K spaces, uh, right? Because this essentially solves what you would want to say in the reflexive case, I guess. And we are not going to be interested in this talk in C of K spaces. We're going to be mainly interested in LP spaces. But um, for those who followed my uh, other talks of mine about the Fricey spaces uh, definition, we are really interested in isometries in the group of uh, linear isometries, not specifically, I mean, not really in uh, the semi group of contractions. So, what we wish to do is concentrate on the case uh, when G is what I denote isom of X, the group of uh, linear isometries on X, I mean, subjective linear isometries. And from now on, because of course, uh, 
we can replace a subset A by its closed linear span, we shall always uh, start with a closed subspace Y of X. So we define from now on the envelope, or if you wish, the isometric envelope as the envelope of Y with, with respect to the isometric group. And so it's not too difficult to have this equivalent definition here, which is a bit more practical. The envelope of Y is the largest uh, subspace of X, such that whenever a net of isometries converges pointwise on Y, then it necessarily converges pointwise on Z. So we do not need here to specify that the convergence is to the identity anymore. We can remove that. And actually, we don't even uh, need to require that the limit is a subjective isometry. The limit here will be, uh, of course, an isometric embedding, but it doesn't have to be subjective. So it's a bit more practical. Um, let me observe that if you, um, if you just take a constant net here, a constant sequence, for example, then you're going to say that uh, the value of an isometry on the envelope is fixed by its value on Y, right? So if you know what the value of, uh, of T is on Y, then you, you, you already know uh, what it has to, I mean, you fixed its value on the envelope. But we are saying a bit more, it's not only this, but something to do with conversions here. So formally, it, it's a bit stronger than just fixing the value. Uh, regarding uh, the works of Korovkin and other authors, uh, this isometric envelope will always be at least as big as the shadow because uh, the isometry group is contained in the semi-group of contractions. And let me give two easy examples. If you had a balance space with only trivial isometries, meaning that all isometries are multiple of the identity, then the envelope of any subspace will be X unless the subspace is just zero, because of course uh, you fix the isometry as soon as you fix the value of it in just one non-zero vector. And uh, on the other hand, in the Hilbert space, then the envelope of any subspace is equal to itself uh, because of the existence of the orthogonal complement. So whatever you prescribe, even if you look at the decomposition of H as Y plus the orthogonal, whatever is the value of uh, an isometry, I mean, take an isometry which fixes uh, Y and the orthogonal, uh, you will not prescribe anything uh, from the value of the isometry on Y, you will not prescribe anything on what should happen on the orthogonal, it's uh, totally independent, right? So, um, you, you will not uh, have rigidity on a bigger uh, subspace than Y. Uh, from a, another point of view, you, you can think that, I like to think of the set of subspaces of X, which are envelopes as some kind of skeleton of the isometric structure of X. Uh, this is reminiscent of, for example, the notion of projectional skeleton defined by Rochef Kubish. Um, so, of course, if X only has trivial isometry, then the skeleton is reduced to zero and the whole space. But if you have a Hilbert space, the Hilbert space is the more flexible of all spaces. If you wish, it has a lot of vertebrae, uh, and uh, every, every uh, subspace belongs to the skeleton. In this case, the skeleton is the whole uh, class of subspaces of H. Okay. Um, so we have a few results about what we can say about envelopes uh, in general. First of all, if the space is separable reflexive, then they must be one complemented. Uh, so this isometric skeleton is a subclass in general of the, the class of uh, one complemented subspaces in this case. And furthermore, the Hilbert space will be the only separable reflexive space for which all subspaces are envelopes. Uh, well, because, uh, because of A and by a uh, result of Kakutani and Bohem Blues in the complex case, uh, that all subspaces are one complemented characterize the Hilbert space. 
And regarding empty spaces, uh, we were able to prove that um, the envelope actually coincides with the minimal envelope. So if you want to think of it more globally, uh, all one complement list of spaces will be envelopes, right? And, and furthermore, uh, among reflexive uh, rearrangement invariant spaces on zero one, uh, the LP spaces are the only one for which we have this. So we have the LP spaces, everyone complement is spaces in envelope, and for the other ones, uh, you have the class, I mean, the, the set of envelopes is strictly smaller than the set of uncomplemented subspaces. So the proof of A uses LUR renormings using a, a result of Gilles Lancien, 93. Some use of duality as well, so the decomposition, uh, witnessing this one complementation, I mean, the, the other summons actually can be seen as the orthogonal of some uh, dual envelopes. Uh, dual envelope, I, I will not go into details here. Uh, and regarding C and G, it can be proved using a description by Peller in 90 of the WT closure of the isometric group through the existence of dilations. And he has, he has also some results for general array spaces on zero one, which give us G. Okay, so it turns out that this envelope, which uh, could be uh, could have been a priori bigger than the shadow, is actually the same, which tells you if you look at isometry, the isometry group versus the uh, semi group of contractions. As soon as you control the convergence of isometries, you control actually the convergence of contractions somehow, right? Okay, so. Um, that was my first part, and now um, um, I'm going to back, go back a little. So let me start another in another direction, and we will see uh, how the envelopes uh, come back a bit later as, as a tool. So uh, I'm starting the second part now, and um, with the notion of Freise banner spaces. So so. One point of view is to start with a classical major rotation problem. So assume X is a separable, separable Banner space and that the uh, linear isometry group acts transitively on the sphere. So it means that you have just one orbit on the sphere for the action of the isometry group on the sphere, or equivalently, uh, you can send any point of the sphere to any of the Point of the sphere by a global isometry on the space. And so mass rotation problem asks whether X must be isomorphic or even isometric to a Hilbert space. So the answer is known to be positive if the space is uh, finite dimensional. And the only relevant case is a separable one because there are non-separable counterexample. So you can take a uh, ultra power of uh, LP space or also uh, ultra power of the Gouraris space. So I, I will uh, not really use the Gouraris space in this talk, so let me just not define it, but from our point of view, this is the natural counterpart of the LP spaces when P is equal to infinity, but I will really concentrate on the LP spaces. And why is it true that that's, that really follows from the fact that uh, capital LP is almost transitive, which means that the, the orbits for the action of the isometric group on the sphere are dense, or if you prefer, you can send any point of the sphere arbitrarily close to any other point of the sphere by an isometry, by a global isometry. Now, if you take uh, ultra power, you will, um, define a natural isometry on the ultra power as a, as a product of isometries on each summand, and you just take isometries which approximate better and better what you wish to obtain, and so in the limit, the epsilons go away. So more generally, if space is almost transitive, then it, its ultra power will be a non-separable transitive example. 
And so the way I see uh, mass rotation problem is that it's really too difficult at this point to hope for a positive answer. But what you maybe should do as a first step is find a property P of the Hilbert space, which is stronger than transitivity, but for which you would still be able to find non-separable counterexamples. Right? You, you still want you want a, a property which is stronger than transitivity, but it, it would still have to do with the difference between separability and non-separability. If you find such a property, uh, of course, investigate whether the Hilbert is the only separable space with this property. And so the example I want to look at is uh, the notion of ultra-homogeneity, which is just a natural uh, multidimensional form of transitivity. So we say that a space is, a Banner space is ultra-homogeneous if any partial axiometry between finite dimensional subspaces of X can be extended to a global axiometry, subjective axiometry. So partial axiometry means just uh, axiometry between subspaces. Here I, I, I start with an axiometry between finite dimensional subspaces. And so there are um, non-separable uh, counterexamples, non-separable and non-Hildersian examples. Aviles, Cabello, Castillo, Gonzalez, and Moreno proved that this is true for uh, the ultra power of the Guerrero space. And as a consequence of, of um, um, our results uh, in this paper, it is also true for uh, ultra, an ultra power of LP space, but then you have to remove the values, the even values different from two. So, uh, and actually, uh, following from some result of Beata, Gondeliana uh, Doanna, inspired from um, construction of Rosenthal, you can prove that it's not true for 4, 6, 8, etc. So, uh, where does this come from? Uh, actually, Lusky in 78 uh, had proved that those LPs are what I call AUH which is just a natural multidimensional version of, um, of almost transitivity, right? So you just want any partial axiometry between finite dimensional subspaces to be approximated by a global axiometry. And of course this used uh, Plotkin and uh, Rudin equimeasurability theorem and results about extension of, of isometries, which is, uh, which holds for uh, uh, if P is different from the values for six, eight, etc. But what is interesting, it does not seem that this property AUH is enough to imply that the ultra power is ultra homogeneous. So we had to, I mean, it seems that it is necessary to consider a, a strengthening of the AUH property. Um, which I will define in the next slide. Actually, we don't know. Maybe AUH is enough, but we, we, we don't know how, how, that, how, how that, that would work. So this is one aspect in which the um, Freise property comes. So the next slide, I'm going to define this strengthening of the, of the AUH property. You have two equivalent ways of seeing it. So the first one, um, so what you want, I mean, this is a bit technical and we're not going to use it, but the point is that you don't want only to be able to approximate a partial isometry between E and F by a global isometry. You want to be able to do it for operators which are one plus delta isometries, which means uh, of norm one, uh, at most one plus delta and the, the norm of the inverse also controlled by one plus delta. And furthermore, you need to know that uh, the delta depends on epsilon and also uniformly on the dimension of the subspaces. Um, anyway, this is uh, obviously a strengthening, formally a strengthening of the AUH property, although we don't know of a counterexample of a space which would be AUH and not Freise, but okay, formally this is a bit stronger. And then if you have this, then you can deduce that the ultra power is ultra homogeneous, actually formally you get a bit more, 
you, you obtain this alpha homogeneity through the natural subgroup, which is obtained by, uh, which is just a subgroup of isometries on the alpha power, which are products of isometries on each summons. Again, this is formally stronger than alpha homogeneity, but I'm not aware of, a, of a kind of, uh, an example proving that it is uh, actually stronger. But anyway, it seems that this is necessary to obtain ultra homogeneity. And so uh, while it was known that the Burari space uh, satisfies this property, uh, it was one of the main uh, results of, of, of that paper uh, with Jordi, Brice, and Stevo that uh, those LP spaces are indeed tri -say. So for the ultra power, we, we do get ultra homogeneity and, and the, using only this uh, specific subgroup. And then it's natural to ask, I mean, uh, the following conjecture, of course, is it, uh, are these the only example, the gray space, those LP spaces uh, in the separable range uh, of Fricey spaces or even of AUH spaces? And, and, and you can see that this is related to the um, multidimensional version of uh, mass rotation problem. If we knew that those spaces are the only separable AUH spaces, then since uh, the Hilbert space is the only ultra homogeneous space among those, then we would deduce in particular that the Hilbert space is the only separable ultra homogeneous space. Uh, of course, I did not comment that obviously the, the Hilbert is ultra, uh, ultra homogeneous just because of uh, of the orthogonal decomposition. So, so this was maybe the main conjecture we had uh, after this paper. And, and so Jordan and I started trying to work on this and then we came up with this, uh, the idea that the notion of envelope would be a, a really uh, important tool to try to prove this conjecture. So uh, I'm gonna start, um, um, in a few minutes um, to try to use the envelope for this. And I forgot that I actually have a few additional comments about the um, price uh, definition. So first of all, I, I have a slide to just uh, comment on the, on the choice of terminology. Uh, so just a comment here, we're not gonna use this in the rest, but just because what I've been talking about is just one aspect of, of that paper uh, with Jordi, Grace, and Stable. Um, a countable structure A is fri say when it is ultra homogeneous with respect to the class called the age of its finite substructures in the natural sense. And um, in 2005, K. Chris and Tordosevich proved the what is now called the KPT correspondence, which uh, states that the um, extreme amenability of the group of automorphisms of A with the pointwise convergent topology is actually equivalent to a certain Ramsey property of the age, actually of the embeddings between elements of the age. So uh, what an extremely amenable uh, group, topological group is a, a, a group such that any continuous action on the compact space at the next fixed point. If you remember uh, Christian Rosendahl talk, he mentioned that uh, topological amenability is asking that uh, any such continuous action that emits a fixed probability measure. So extreme amenability is requiring that the measure is uh, concentrated on, on just one point. And Originally, our definition of Freisebana spaces was aimed at imitating this, this, uh, this countable result, this uh, KPT correspondence, in the setting of Bana spaces. Uh, and in particular, in order to recover the known extreme amenability, extreme amenability of the unitary group, which was due to uh, Gromov and Milman 83, as well as uh, the extreme amenability of the asymmetry group of the LP spaces by John Adel Pestov in seven. But we wanted to obtain it internally through the use of the subspaces uh, of LP or of the hyperspace and through Ramsey methods instead of concentration of measure 
uh, as used by those authors. And let us note that uh, before that, the isometric group of the plural space had been proved to be extremely amenable by Dana Bortosova, Lopez Abad, Pini, and Bobo. Just a comment. Uh, Although we have similar similarities, in the end, our philosophy is really different because people who work in fresh theory usually um, what is natural and what is easier to work with is the class, is the age, the class of finite substructures. And then the, uh, the countable structure, which is the Fricey limit of the, of the age, is usually defined in an abstract way. And, and you prove its properties from the finite parts. Uh, if you think of the Gurari, this is, uh, in this setting, the Gurari is defined, maybe seen as defined abstractly as a pricey limit of the class of finite dimensional uh, spaces. But for the LP spaces, which are main interest, this is somehow reversed because what is given and natural for us is really the, the Fresi limit, the, the, the global object is already given, it's LP space. Uh, and so uh, it's, it is more natural to prove the properties from the global properties of LP already instead of trying to look at the finite dimensions of spaces. But anyhow, um, let me um, List a few interesting properties of Freisebana spaces, which are also uh, reminiscent of properties which are known in the classical Freisig case. So, but of course, uh, in the Banner space setting, you have to introduce epsilons. First of all, we prove that if uh, X and Y are separable and Freise, uh, and if they, are, if they have the same local structure, so if they are finitely representable, representable into each other, then they must be exometric. So X is finitely representable in Y, into Y if any finite dimensional subspace of X has a one plus epsilon isomorphic copy inside Y with arbitrary epsilon. So there are Fricy spaces, separable Fricy spaces are determined by their local structure among uh, Fricy spaces, right? So given a local structure, we have at most one Fricy space with this local structure. And furthermore, whenever you have a separable space which is finitely representable into Fricy space, then necessarily it already uh, embeds isometrically into it. So this is a very strong uh, rigidity property, if you wish. And um, As a consequence, every Fricy space will have to contain an isometric copy of L2 because by Dvoretsky, uh, L2 is uh, finitely representable into a, any infinite dimensional Banner space. And that's uh, obviously an unusual way of proving that uh, LP spaces contain an isometric copy of L2. Now you, the usual proof is by uh, independent Gaussian uh, variables. But okay, we, we managed to obtain this through this uh, Fricy property, although we just obtained prove it for P different from 4, 6, 8, so it's a bit, maybe a bit strange, but okay. So, but of course, but for us it is interesting because it's, it's marginally true of every Fricy space. And similarly, a uh, separable Fricy space either has finite cotype or must be isometric to the Gouary space because since L infinity is finitely representable in any space which does not have finite cotype, so in particular the Gouary will be finitely representable in any space which doesn't have finite cotype. So from the first part here, we will have that. Uh, will have necessarily an isometry between them. So, 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 I mean, if we are looking at what can be the possible Fricy spaces, we can already go to the finite cotype case. Okay. So let us now try to see how the envelope can be useful to say a bit more about Fricy spaces. 
Well, the envelope admits an equivalent definition to separable AUH spaces, in particular also in FRIC spaces. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, usually the envelope tells you something about the isometric, isometric structure of the space, uh, but about the global isometry group, uh, subjective isometries. But if you are in an AUH space, then you know that any partial isometry, at least between finite dimensional subspaces, can be approximated by the global isometry. So suddenly the envelope will also tell you something about partial isometries. And by taking limits, you can uh, actually uh, prove the following. So uh, if X is separable AUH and Y is a subspace, then you can also characterize the envelope as the larger subspace uh, Z of X containing Y with the property that every isometric embedding of Y into X admits a unique extension uh, to um, isometric embedding to the envelope, and the map is uh, SOG to SOG continuous. So um, furthermore, you can then prove that it will send the envelope to the envelope of the image. So, so what happens is that for any uh, partial isometry between subspaces, you will have a canonical and unique extension between the envelopes, right? So as a corollary in particular, in this case, this angle here means that Y and Z are isometric. So if Y is isometric to Z, then the envelopes are isometric. So as I said, it's a bit more, it's more than that. Any isometry between them will extend in a unique way to an isometry between the envelopes. But it, it means therefore that, uh, up to isometries, every subspace has a unique envelope. The, the envelope is uniquely determined by the isometry class of Y. Um, so, um, as a consequence, um, well, it makes sense. I mean, so we computed uh, we computed uh, several examples of envelopes in uh, the appropriate LP spaces. So. Um, the following subspaces of LP have an envelope isometric to capital LP. So the Hilbert space, and unless we were in, in uh, the Hilbert space, also um, Euclidean spaces of dimension at least two. Um, For the values of P and Q for which LP contains an isometric copy of LQ, then you also have that the envelope is isometric to LP and the same for little uh, LQ. So uh, it's reasonable to understand that because since the envelope has to be one complemented inside the LP space, it has to be some LP of me of mu space. And then you just need to show that there is no atomic part to this subspace and essentially you remove you prove that there is no atomic part by using that for example l2 does not embed isometrically into little lp and that's essentially enough to 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 prove the result so this has an interesting consequence well we let us say that the subspace of X is full if it has full envelope, is the envelope of the whole of X. Um, this is maybe where we can see uh, an analogy with the notion of support uh, um, in LP spaces. I mean, certainly uh, if the subspace is full, it, ha it has to have full support if you didn't have full support, then the envelope could be at most LP of the support of it. Anyway, so, um, um, so as a consequence of the above, so um, first of all, 
you will find a full copy of L2 inside the LP spaces. Why? Because first of all, uh, you have a, you pick a copy of L2. You the envelope is some subspace of LP as a metric to LP, but then you can transfer this. <clears throat> if you just take a, an isometry from the envelope of L2 to the global LP, you will then necessarily send your initial copy of L2 to a copy which is full. So from this, it's straightforward to get this. So from abstract arguments, we, we, contain, we obtain a, a copy of L2, which is full in LP, but um, at this point, we were not able to find any explicit description of, of such uh, from independent Gaussian variables or something like that. And in particular, this is also, tr also true for, for example, L22 here. So it means that you find there exists a certain copy, uh, two-dimensional uh, Hilbertian copy inside LP, which uh, for which, uh, so that if you know the behavior of isometries on it, then you already, uh, you already prescribe the behavior of uh, the isometry globally on LP. I mean, uh, so, and, and um, let us note that this in particular also implies that we shall induce a certain topological embedding of the unitary group as a subgroup of the isometric group of LP because any um, unitary here, so any isometry of L2 will extend to an isometry of the envelopes of course, in this case, since we chose a full copy of L2, the envelopes are the LP space, so we are actually uh, extending and in a SOT, SOT continuous way, and isometry of L, uh, of L2 as a global isometry, but again, I'm not sure uh, how this can be seen concretely at this point. And um, Curious consequence is the following. Um, it means that we can define in a canonical way the quotient of LP by L2 for, for the appropriate values of P. So what I'm claiming here is that there will be a unique uh, exact sequence up to isometric, uh, isometric equivalence uh, associated to full embeddings of L2 into LP. So let us take just two uh, arbitrary full copies of L2 inside LP and look at the uh, exact sequence associated to the uh, embedding. So we have a, a first embedding of L2 inside LP with the associated quotient, the same here. So as I was explaining, if you take any isometry uh, between them, T, then it will extend in a unique way a canonical way to a global isometry between the envelopes, which in this case are the LP space. And so this will induce in particular uh, an isometry between the quotients, which makes the, makes the diagram commute, but in particular, so uh, the quotient here is isometrically unique, provided you had chosen for L2 uh, a full copy of L2. Uh, so, it seems a natural question, what is this canonical quotient LP by L2? Uh, we don't know. Um, if P is bigger than 1, then since L2 is complemented um, in LP, and since LP is primary, then this quotient has to be isomorphic to LP. This symbol means isomorphic here. So LP over L2, you have to be certain, a certain canonical renorming of LP uh, corresponding to that situation, which uh, to us is still very mysterious. If P is equal to one, then we know that L2 is not complemented. And so uh, at this point, we have no clue on what could be even isomorphically the quotient of L1 by L2. And of course, we can have the same question for LP over LQ or LP over little LQ for appropriate values of P and Q. Okay, so um, 
all these were the consequences that we were able to deduce on LP spaces. And of course, our, our main aim was to uh, apply this to general fricy spaces uh, with the objective of um, trying to prove that the LP spaces were and the Gruary was the only separable phase spaces or AOH spaces. So, so let me sum up at this point what we can say about possible other phase spaces uh, in the separable range. So first of all, as I said, if X is separable and phase say that it has to contain an isometric copy of L2, uh, it seems to be open whether it, it should or not contain a full isometric copy of L2. Uh, if this were true, then by the previous discussion, the isometry group of X would have to be, of course, very big and contain a subgroup isomorphic to the unitary group. Um, other interesting fact, if you take uh, the P of X, the supremum of the types of X, then by Moray Pizier's uh, result about um, um, finite representability, finite represent uh, representability of LP inside X uh, in that case, and by the Fricey property, then we would necessarily uh, contain an iso isometric copy of capital LP for P equal to this P of X. And the same for Q of X, if it is smaller than the infinity, uh, remember that if it is infinity, then we already know that it has to be the Gruary. Also, uh, it's not too difficult to prove from the uh, Fricey property that if X is at least one complement in this by dual, then whenever Y is K complemented in X, then any other isometric copy of Y inside X is again K complemented. For, for the LP spaces, it had been proved by by Beata, um, but this is actually a feature of, of Fricey spaces in general. And so, I mean, from all these conditions, uh, you can see that it's, at this point, it seems to be difficult to, to find a candidate for a Fricey uh, separable space other than the LP spaces of the Gurari. Finally, a uh, last result that we obtained and actually was suggested by Gilles Godefroy. Uh, if X is separable, if I say, and admits a C infinity, infinity bump, bump function, so this, of course, eliminates the LP spaces for P not even, then it's possible to prove that X actually has to be isomorphic to the Hilbert space. It's actually a combination of using classical results about, uh, among them, Maury PCA's results, uh, uh, result of Pizier about duality between type and cotype, as well as uh, a result of Deville about, um, about uh, spaces with C infinity bump functions. Um, but uh, of course, at this point, the, the, the question of whether the LP spaces or uh, uh, the Gruary uh, space are the only AUH of Fricey spaces remain uh, wide open. Um, to conclude, uh, small but uh, bibliography. So this is a survey about what was known at that time, and mainly what is known about uh, Kurovkin theorems for LP spaces or more generally in reflexive range. Our paper uh, about amalgamation and the property of LP spaces. Work of K. Chris Best of Todosevich about the KPT correspondence and a very good survey of Beata about normal projection in banner spaces that we uh, used quite a lot in our work. So thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you so much, Valentine. Um, beautiful talk. <clears throat> um, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Uh, can you go back to, I think it's slide 15 or maybe 14. This one? Uh, no, 14. This one. Yeah, the question, yeah. The question about a two-dimensional Hilbert space 
an explicit mm -hmm. two-dimensional Hilbert space in LP, such that any isometry on it extends to an isometry on LP. I think that just that if you take two independent Gaussians, this is a case, and it follows from the Rudin Plotkin because, well, first of all, you can change the density to have one of them being the function one and the other, uh -huh. some, it, it will be some ratio of two. Yeah, yeah. In, in, and so you so think that, uh, you think that you, uh, so, so if one of possible. them is, mm -hmm. I'm saying they're just two, two independent Gaussians. And the proof is the following. You first change the density to make mm -hmm. one of them one and the other one you don't know one. But you did, but so, mm -hmm. so you, then you can apply the mm -hmm. plotkin rudin thing to extend mm -hmm. the isometry on that and then go back to the original space. Through yeah, the but then, so, so you are saying that you can, um, sorry. So you are saying that you, it, it is possible to analyze the uh, the case of two independent Gaussians. Yeah. So so if you take the quotient of two uh, independent variables, you are saying that it is uh, possible to analyze the the distribution of this. And right. Uh, assuming that you know what I don't know what you, you mean by analyze, but using yeah. the mm -hmm. Rudin, Rudin Plotkin, which is I don't know if you. Consider the plotkin rudin extension. Yeah, yeah, you will take. Uh, I mean, you will, that you can analyze. Yeah, you you will have an, um, maybe. I mean, we have a we have a, a notion of envelope, which I mean, you 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 will at least extend to all um, functions which are Borel combinations, right, of one and this quotient. Yeah, we were hoping something like this would work, but at least we have not uh, been able to get convinced, but. Uh, uh, yeah, if you, if you uh, maybe then we can discuss this afterwards and if, if okay. was, yeah, that, that, that would be very nice. Yeah. All right, thank you. Any others? <clears throat> can I ask something, Valentine? Sure. Uh, these ultra homogeneous uh, spaces that you described uh, do they have some relationship with Banach spaces satisfying uh, Tingley's problem? Which problem? I mean, uh, those uh, spaces where the isometries on the unit sphere can be extended to the unit ball. Yeah. Uh... So sorry, I didn't get what you said. What is the I property? Mean, Can you tell us the property? Yeah, the, the so-called Tinkley's uh, property. Isometries on the unit sphere can be extended uh, to an isometry on the unit ball. But I mean, okay, here I'm really just working with linear isometries, so um, I don't, I, I mean, so an isometry on the sphere in itself doesn't really make sense. So I'm saying nothing about isometries which are not linear. I'm not sure if. Okay, okay it's probably, okay. Uh, any others? <laughs> So the, the capital, uh, sorry, the function or its spaces, did you check that for Fraser, Fraser property? Well, uh, these things will probably be too rigid. I mean, um, I would say it's not possible for an ARI space other than the LP spaces to be um, Fraser because the isometry group is too rigid in some sense, too small. So I'm okay. not sure I can give you a, a statement, but and for the same reason, C of K spaces do not seem relevant uh, in this setting. Uh, well, of course, because if it's split in infinity, it has to be the Gurari, but... Um, so I would guess you have to look for something which has... Uh, yeah, I would say it would not work with all X spaces. Okay. 
All right, thank you so much if there are no other uh, questions. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Valentine, for a beautiful talk. Thank you.